Hi, welcome to the inflector video on exploratory testing. How to incorporate exploratory testing into your real testing scenario. My name is Adam Sandman. And in today's agenda, we're going to be going through um, several things. But the first thing will be, um, you know, where and, and why would you use exploratory testing? Um, how does it fit into the overall testing strategy that you have and into your overall test plan? What are some of the benefits of it? Uh, we'll then look at some tools you can use uh, to make exploratory testing easier. Now, obviously, you can use various different tools. We've got some specific recommendations based on some of what our clients are using, what we're using ourselves. And then the last piece we want to take away is how do you fix exploratory testing into your process, into your agile sprints, where you may have a lot of automated tests already in place, you may have a robust DevOps strategy in place. You know, how do you fit exploratory testing and what is the best way? What are some of the lessons learned to avoid communication issues too? So first of all, um, why use exploratory testing? And to go back to that question, we have to first answer a bigger question, which is really, why do we do testing at all? We could easily just um, develop an application, we could build the features, and then we could ship it, right? We could do that. Some people do do that. Um, and what happens then is that your users basically will test for you, which is a strategy. And if you do that, um, the, the risk is that your users will find that your application is really buggy and not use it. If it's a consumer app, they'll use something else. If it's a business app, they'll probably revolt to your management. So really what testing does is it's a way to manage the technical risk in a system so that you can decide, is this system ready for release? Testing doesn't mean it's bug free. Testing doesn't mean it's perfect. Testing means we have determined based on some activities we've done um, that the risk of releasing is, is, is low and that, and that the business risk of us going live now is, is manageable and the, and the risk to the business of not releasing perhaps because another company will release sooner than us and we won't have a business at all is lower. So it's basically determining you know, what is the risk and return of releasing now versus a month from now versus a month earlier. So we use testing to inform for the management team what is the risk of this project, the technical risk. Um, there's always market risk. Is it the right thing we've built? Well, testing won't always find that. Um, you know, if it's the wrong product at the wrong time, even if it's the best tested application, it's not going to work. So, and that's that's the conceptual risk and the business risk. There's a market risk, um, there's financial risk, lots of different types of risks as a project a product owner is going to think about. But as a QA lead, your job is to help the product owner understand the technical risk because the developers will have built a system and, and they'll architect it and the, the, the performance engineers and the DBAs, they're all trying to reduce the technical risk. But ultimately, testing is where the rubber meets the road. It's where you're able to assess what is the true state of the technical risk. So let's imagine we're the uh, QA lead or maybe the product owner and we get to this situation. Uh, we have a really good DevOps strategy. We have a, a good code management system. We've got a whole bunch of user stories. Um, they're well written. We've got acceptance criteria. They're all well written. We've got a whole bunch of automated tests. We're doing, it's a web, let's say it's a web application. We've got some J unit tests for all of our unit testing, we've got Selenium tests or what other automation tests for the UI, we've got some automated uh, API tests for all of our endpoints, you know, or everything is green on the dashboard. Should we ship the product? That's a good question. Should we ship the product? Um, as, I get, as I mentioned at the beginning, technical risk is what we're trying to figure out here. And so the question is, do all those automated tests at the various levels I talked about, the unit tests, the functional tests, the API tests, have we mitigated all the, and assessed all the technical risk? So hold that thought for one second. Before we answer that question, we need to think about what we've done. So first of all, let's look at the box. The box is our system, right? We've got some user stories. We may have some other requirements that are not user stories. Maybe they're the, the uh, performance requirements, the uh, security requirements. Maybe there's the uh, use cases, other things which are part of defining the system. So we've defined the system. We've also got a bunch of automated tests that tells us that the box that we've defined and the box that we're testing match. So we have 100% test coverage. Should we ship? Okay, well, there's a slight wrinkle to it, which is the real system if, if any of you develop systems, and you'll know this, the real system is never quite as neat as that. That's what the real system looks like. It's got some things that maybe, when, you, when the user story is written at a high level, describe how it works, but deep down in the guts of the system, the developers and probably some of the testers will know, in reality, there's things that maybe 
aren't quite defined in the user story. There's some wiggle room. Maybe if these exact things happen, something weird's going to happen. You know, what browsers are our users using? You know, we've designed this for Chrome, for Firefox, for modern browsers, Safari. Maybe our users are also using IE. Maybe our users are also using Edge. Maybe Safari's got some weird kinks coming out. So there's lots of things around the edges of an actual system that don't make it quite as neat as what's in the user stories and the requirements. So this is our actual system. And so if we overlay these two, we get what's called the edge cases. And I did this diagram deliberately because it shows that they're at the edge. And these edge cases are the things where the developer may have uh, built the system, the may have gone through some basic you know, human testing as well, and maybe have some manual scripts, some UAT scripts. We've got all the automation we talked about already. It's all passing. I guarantee you, from experience of our own systems and our customer systems, we have, you have missed something. There are things that are in the actual system that you have missed. And these are the edge cases. These are the things that no one, why would anyone do that? Well, because users are users and they do that. And so you've got these edges. So what is explorey testing? Well, it's a way to find those edges. And why do we find this is important? Well, because if those edges are found by a tester, they're going to be found by a customer or a user, and you'd much rather know that you found it than someone else did. Someone, if you if you see on Twitter that the bug report was a, a user logging on Twitter that your application didn't work, and that's far worse than having someone log an issue in your internal bug tracking tool that there's, that there's an issue. So we all want to avoid our customers being our testers. We want to find the risk and mitigate it ourselves. And the reason why this happens is that really good testers, as opposed to maybe an automation engineer, which is a different role, a good tester will find things that no one knows about. We have a test in our office. She just has to look at the screen and it breaks. She just touches it and we'll even say to her, what did you do? And we're like, I don't know what I did, but I did it and this is what happened. And we're like, okay. Um, and if you have really good testers, you know, you should harness that intuition that they have and you should not frustrate it. Trying to make them follow a manual test script step by step is not a good use of their time. Having them write Selenium tests or automation tests using Ranarex or Rapease or other tools is not a good use of their time. Um, that's not what they're good at. They're good at finding the stuff that, that you don't know to look for. Um, and as, as someone once said, it's the unknown unknowns, and it was used, I think, in a different context. But we know we know we have known problems in the system. The developers may even know some of the problems, and maybe the testers and the management know of some of the areas. But in addition to all those areas, there's also the ones we don't even know about, the unknown unknowns. And you'll never know them till you start looking for them. And if you don't look for them, you won't find them. And Explorer testing is a way to let testers explore the system and actually find these things. And so that's why it's really important. It's also useful because sometimes at the beginning, the functionality is still being evolved. And especially in Agile, where you have a minimum, minimum viable product, and you want feedback not only on the system in terms of its testing, but its usability. You want also some of this feedback earlier in the cycle, in the sprint, before you build everything. Um, it's really useful to do exploratory testing uh, earlier on as well as later on. And because it doesn't rely on a formal script and it just requires on, on a, a user story and maybe a, what's called a testing charter, which is where you, you give that tester kind of a goal, like explore this section and go find these kinds of things. It's very easy to do at the beginning because the tester doesn't have to have a lot of upfront information. They just need to know enough from the user story and maybe some guidelines in the charter. And so while they're off doing that and you're building your system in your sprint, um, they can find things that can then help you influence the sprint before you've built all that code. So it's actually really useful for the developer um, to help inform where you're going. So, you know, that's that's kind of the basics of it. Now, there's a whole bunch of material out there on exploratory testing. Uh, we've given a previous webinar on what the, on what it actually is in terms of the details of a charter and session-based testing. Um, I'm not going to go th into all of that, um, but we did find there are some tools that help. Uh, and before we get into the tools, just one thing to bear in mind is there are different names for it. There's a, there, there are session-based testing. Uh, there's exploratory testing, freeform testing. Um, the basic concept is you give a tester a, a block of time, say 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and they're going to go off and explore the system. It's not completely freeform. They're usually given a charter, which is like an area of to explore and boundaries of what not to explore potentially. Uh, and they're usually given the user story, requirements, and some guide, guidance as to what they're doing. And what you want them to do is record what they did in a session and document it in a way that developers could then reproduce it. Um, and that's one of the challenges with exploratory testing is that developers can, testers can go off and do stuff, but it's sometimes it's hard to know what they did. It's hard to tie that back into your process. And so one of the things we're talking about today is how do you use it in your process? So the first thing we'll talk about is capture tools. So you can obviously have a, a, a exploratory tester 
just simply go off and do stuff and write things down on a piece of paper and uh, we have done that and that isn't the most efficient the problem with that will be is it's in a piece of paper that no one's going to see the testers largely doing it in their own form and free in some kind of something that's meaningful to them developers aren't going to understand how to find things it's also one long stream of consciousness over a, say a 30 40 minute period it's hard to then to, to figure out what are the action items from that what do we do with this information how do we use it it's very helpful but what do we do with it so uh, the first thing we would recommend is get a real-time capture tool and there are plenty on the market there are, there are browser plugins some people we know use QuickTime just to record video and the browser capture. Um, one tool that we found particularly interesting is a tool called Bug Replay. It's not by our company, but we have partnered with them. It's a company that makes a tool called, called Bug Replay. And what's really neat about Bug Replay is it captures the video of what you're doing. It captures screenshots, but it also captures the logs and the network traffic and things in the browser tab, the URL you, you clicked on, the cookies you used, the session information, various other metrics that are in the browser and it correlates them together automatically so you can basically scroll through a session and be able to see for a particular time block um, and you can put bookmarks you know between this time block and that time block this happened and more importantly for a developer when something happened like an error page came up they often want to know what were the things that went into doing that and the developer might not real a tester might not realize oh when the error page happened really it was four you know four minutes further back that's when the real issue occurred that led to the error page and the developer will need to know that. And so a real-time capture tool like Bug Replay, where it's video, it's, it's, it's um, screenshots, it's logs, it's network traffic, it's all the information together, will save them a lot of time in trying to reproduce something just by following a video in its own or just by following a written report. So it's really important to have these tools. So look, look at Bug Replay. Uh, there are other tools on the market. It's not the only one. Uh, again, feel free to have something, but do have something. And make sure it's something that captures the data that you need. This is obviously a web application, so a web-based capture tool is the right one. If it's a mobile app, there are some different tools you'll use. If it's a, a desktop app, there's other tools again. So get, get some tools that will work for your testing and make sure you can capture all the information your developers need. And that's why, as a tester, you need to talk to your developers because if you're capturing stuff that they don't need, then that's a waste of time, waste of energy. And if you're not capturing things they do need, then you're not going to help them. So find out what metrics they would need to find the bugs and understand where it occurred. And if it, if it needs to be a debug version of the application that's running, which is capturing stuff, you know, if it's something really custom like that, that's fine also. Whatever it, diagnostics they're going to need to be able to reproduce what you did as easily as possible, make sure you have those. The second thing, have a tool to capture what their findings are. And you can use a test management tool, you can use a spreadsheet, you can just use a piece of paper, you could use bug, bug reports. Um, so you can use any of those, but we would actually suggest that you look at something that actually can help you, is designed to help you do this. And so uh, this is our plug, um, Spyro Test, which is our test management tool, does have a special exploratory testing mode that we built specifically for this purpose. And it has a couple of things that make it different from our regular test management uh, tool. And Spyrotest has can run it in both the normal mode and exploratory mode. So when in exploratory mode, the one thing it can do is it can let you um, write the test as you're doing it, and it can let you document in, as you're doing it. So in a traditional test management tool, the tester or test manager or the test writer writes some tests. They run some steps. They write some instructions. The tester follows those, and then when it doesn't work, they log a bug and a failure. In the exploratory test management tool, what you do is you write the charter. So at the top, we have this name of the test, and then we have this description, and that's going to be the charter. That's telling the tester, what do we want you to explore? What do we want you to do? That's all they're going to get. Then the tester starts to do stuff. They do their, their session, and they're not going to write down every single thing because the capture tool is doing that. But the key, the key points they're going to write down, like, okay, I'm exploring the login page. I'm exploring the uh, book creation page, the you know the user profile editing page. Um, they're going to put in some key points, and then when they hit something, uh, knowing that it's being captured in detail, they don't need to put everything in here. They're going to want to put down some of the key findings. So, for example, th if they got an error message. If something to them doesn't look right, um, they can put these in here as steps and actions. And when something happens that the developer needs to take note of, we need to be able to document that. And that's one of the challenges we have found is that people will often uh, want to log bugs for everything. And that, that, that causes a problem. 
Because if you log bugs for everything, um, it tends to upset your developers. Because the developers will be like, well, this system isn't actually, uh, you know, ready. We didn't expect to get bugs. We don't want to. We've got a bunch of bugs from the last release, which we know we have to look at when we get closer to the end. But we don't want to incorporate those now. So if you start logging hundreds of bugs in a system that's still in, in the sprint being developed, it's a very unfortunately a way to create a lot of animosity and negative communication because if everything's a bug then everything has to be fixed and when you're exploring a system really some of these things may just be questions like oh this web page worked a certain way um, that wasn't what I expected based on the user story but the user story is pretty high level uh, we need to think talk about this and so what we decided was you need a way to communicate with developers that's not as presumptive as a bug and so in exploratory mode, you can log things called tasks. And unlike a bug, the workflow is very different. They're designed to be logged very quickly. Um, at the end of the sprint, you don't have to you don't have, you don't have to close them all. They're not like defects have to be fixed. A task is an action. The action might just be the conversation. We talked about it, and you know what? This functionality is totally fine. Or we talked about it, and this functionality doesn't make any sense. We're going to take it out of the sprint. Or we talked about it, and it is an issue, uh, but we're really going to be working on it. So tasks tied to exploratory session results which are really important because the problem is if you have a, a one hour session with a bunch of recordings and a bunch of video and a bunch of logs um, who's looking at that and who's in acting on it so by taking that one session and breaking it down to six or seven different tasks you might have different people involved in it maybe the UX person looks at one task the developer looks at another task it's really important to have that, that discrete breakdown and so that leads us into how do we incorporate into Sprint so you've got a sprint. Uh, how do you incorporate session or, or exploratory-based testing? And so, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, what is session-based testing? It's uh, an, an evolution in some ways of exploratory testing. It's basically free-form testing or exploratory testing with some structure. So as I mentioned earlier on, it's basically a time box session. You take a session, session of time, and you say, you're going to have 30 minutes to explore the user profile part of the system and maybe you give more, some more guidance than that like for example um, we know it doesn't work right now with single sign-on but we know it works with native sign-on so don't so focus on that set that part of things and you know we test it we know it should work in all browsers uh, you know go have fun and then you get into a bit more detail if you, if you have something maybe further along in the sprint where it's like you know we've tested this this and this we're really worried about this so you might even say you know we're worried about this part of the system we don't know exactly what's wrong with it but we know that something's not right it's been doing some weird things can you go do a deep dive session and find everything that can go wrong with this so depending where you are in the sprint the nature of the session might be different the nature of the charter will be different and so as I said, on if you're using a test management tool like SpiroTest, then the test cases become basically that description. They become that session overview. Um, now one good thing about a test management tool rather than just using a, a spreadsheet or a paper is that you can link it to requirements because one of the things people talk about is, well, I've, what's my requirements coverage of exploratory testing? What's progress? How do I know if I'm testing everything? How do I know I'm missing things? And so one of the things you can do is you can have your, your user stories and your requirements and you can tie your exploratory test cases to it, just like a regular test, just like a manual test, just like an automated test. And so that way you guarantee that you make sure you're not having all the, the exploratory testing to test just one part of the system. Because if your tester just tests the login page but nothing else, whilst they may have the world's best login page, maybe most of the business risk is not there. And in fact, if your user stories are prioritized with business risk and business priority, maybe your user, your user testing, your exploratory testing should focus on those ones first. So having uh, the test cases, the exploratory test cases tied back to your requirements is as valuable as it is for other kinds of testing. So we would say that's a good thing to do. Um, and, and though executing a test case means following the path, because it's an exploratory test, the test is not a, a set of steps like a regular test, like a manual test or an automated test. It's a series of findings and observations. The, the tester is looking for things that may not be the path they were thinking of. They may see something that jumps out of them and go, well, I wasn't going to spend my time looking at this, but this is really interesting and really worrying for me. I need to go find that. So they're recording their observations. Um, some of these observations may not be problems. So there are things like you may log a, a warning step, you may log an error, um, and these are just their thoughts. So the tester thinks, well, this is, looks like it's a problem to me. I'm recording it as a problem, or I think this isn't a, a bug or anything. This is just something that's a bit of a warning to me. It's a red flag that we should look at. Or maybe this is totally fine. It passes what I was expecting, but I don't know if we've thought about this other thing. So it's a series of steps that get recorded during the testing, and you can categorize them as you know, a pass or a fail or a caution, just like a regular test case. But the meaning is that they are, are applying 
their findings based on their understanding and they know that based on the fact that this is early in the sprint this test is not this test is not meant to pass yet this requirement is not done yet but the but the information is very valuable and very important uh, and the challenge is that we do find when we find this in our team when we've had people doing this is that um, it's sometimes not well communicated so the developers finish the coding and they tell the tester oh you know it's ready to test go ahead and the tester starts doing it and says, well, it broke when I first used it. So the, the developers and the testers will be like, well, I, well, when I said it was done, I meant, you know, don't do these 10 things. And so the tester will get frustrated. So it's important to have good communication and be open and honest. So when you write the, the, the test charter, when you write the test case with the description, um, make sure you're clear about what not to test as well as what to test. Because nothing is more frustrating for a tester than I've set up for, for an hour, I've got to start recording, and the first thing I do breaks, and, it's, and I don't understand why, because that's something that should be so obviously working. Um, make sure you communicate where things truly are. So the tester needs to know when they hit a problem, is it broken or is it not done? Because they can lock a whole bunch of observations of it not being done, but if, if, if the whole test run result is not done, not done, not done, you know, why did I waste an hour of my time? Because you probably knew that already. So be, as, a, as a developer, make sure you um, are very clear at the beginning what the charter should be and what it should not be. The next thing would be and this is funny, any kind of test, this is true. The developer of the tester can run the can read the exact same exploratory test resort report and take two different takeaways out of it. The tester reads it and go, you know, writes it one way, which is it's all broken, it doesn't work in these ten ways, and the developer's like, oh, but it all works for me when I try and follow your steps and try and reproduce your observations. I don't understand. So that's that is the nature of testing and development. Um, make sure the team understand that and they they know that they come from different places and it's not something to get angry about and argue about and uh, know that developers and testers do have different perspectives and uh, having something that's written down an objective could help that also having good means of communication if it's face to face actually both can go into a room together and look at it if, you, if you're remote use it use a messaging tool like slack or something else make sure you have good communication if, as much as possible and then, as I mentioned, one of the challenges is with exploratory testing in general in, is that you end up with a lot of observations. Using the tasks is really helpful. Have some way of taking an observation, a session, break it down to tasks. Decide in the task, this task might be review this, I think it's okay, but I want you to look at it, versus I think this is broken, versus I know this is broken, but still I think you should think of these things. So make sure you use tasks, make sure you understand when you write, assign, write the task and assign the task, the person who's getting the task knows what you want them to do. And maybe that may be just when, as you develop this piece of functionality, bear this in mind. So the task may have no immediate action, but it's really important to have different tasks, different people, and they use correctly. Because if you have a, if your 100 bugs are logged, you're going to create a lot of enemies and a lot of resentment, and then people are not going to want to look into the solution. They're just going to want to close the bug as quickly as possible, and that's not the point of this. And then at some point, you will get to a point where logging tasks and, and results may not make as much sense. Maybe you want to start logging defects. Maybe you're doing some exploratory testing early in the sprint. You have a bunch of tasks. The developer fixes everything. We, all the automated tests run. We're going live in three days from now. The tester comes in, does a, does a quick high-level exploratory test across some of the key areas and finds some major issues. At this point, we're not logging tasks. We should be logging defects. These are showstoppers before we go live. So there is definitely a transition point where you move from one methodology or one way of using the methodology to another. Make sure your process is flexible. Don't become a straight jacketed by what worked earlier in the sprint or earlier in the release when you're getting close to the go live. When you're going live, it's important to think about what's going to hold the release up because bear in mind in the end, Testing is about mitigating business risk, and if the risk is going live with a system that's broken, um, that's a really high risk. And as a test, that you you know owe it to the product owner to make sure that's es that's as clearly and communicated uh, appropriately. Equally, when you're early in the sprint and this test is really mitigating the business risk of the developer not building something correctly, but it's not going live for a significant amount of time, you don't necessarily want to you know, raise the flag with a whole bunch of defects. Use something that communicates well to the developer. So, right tool at the right time. Thanks for watching today's video on exploratory testing. If you'd like to learn more about software testing, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Have a great day.